Hello, and my name is Peter Rushmer, and I'm your host today of a Half Dozen Things podcast. A Half Dozen Things is a podcast for business owners and professionals just like you. Whether you're an underdog hungry for success or you're already smashing it but want to continue to level up, we're here each week for you to get insight and learning from the very best in the business. No fluff, no BS and no self-proclaimed gurus talking about how easy business or life is. Just real, frank and raw conversations. Good morning, Simon. How are you today? I'm fine, Pete. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks for joining me today on a Half Dozen Things podcast. Uh, I've just introduced the listeners to you uh, on, on your introduction, um, and we're going to be speaking today about GDPR, which is an area of specialism for you and something you do in business. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about um, how you can help with GDPR and make sure that businesses stay compliant? Well, I, I mean, I, I, the first thing is... Um, I'm almost reluctant to say GDPR because um, I think people are quite bored with it or it's uh, it's fallen down on their agenda. But I think what is important is that companies realise that um, if their staff are working from home, then you need to seriously think about uh, the tools that they're using to, uh, to communicate with the business and the environment that they're working. And so what I've done today is I've created six different environments that one of your staff members might find themselves working in. And, and the reason I've done this is because it's all to do with data and the security of the data and, and how your staff use it and look after it. Because at the end of the day, if your business has a number of customers, or in fact, a number of staff, and you've got staff all over the country uh, using this data for whatever reason. And uh, it goes and they lose it or it gets stolen by a competitor, then the, the impact on you as a business could be quite large. So, so what I was gonna do was um, try and use the word GDPR as little as possible, um, but try to um, businesses today um, in this current environment and also go forward because there are there are businesses that have now realized that actually most of our staff can work from home and and why not let them work from home um, you know let's downsize our office space and um, and, and save money so um, so that's been one of the big things so when when this starts when you decide I know the decision has already been made in reality but if you were to decide um who was going to be working from home and the risk to the business you would you would ideally take each individual staff member stand the environment that they're going to be working in so the reason there's several reasons why you do this so if we take an example so maybe you've got your accounts team and your accounts team is made up of a, a let's say a family person with kids um, and uh, some young accountants who are uh, maybe in a shared house um, or, or living with their parents. So straight away, you've got three different scenarios there. And, and what I would do is I would look at each one of those individually. So we'll take the, the head of the accounts team. So he's got his, um, uh, he's not got an office at home yet, uh, he's got a reasonable size house, he's got a partner and he's got children. And he is saying that he's likely to be working from his uh, either kitchen table or the dining room table. And uh, he has one laptop at home and do some of that. Um, and they play, so they play some of their games on it. Okay, so the first thing is, you've got a scenario where uh, the machine that the person is using, um, you won't necessarily know uh, the uh, cyber security where you could have something, you could have nothing. 
Uh, is it using Windows? Um, or is, uh, Android machine? Um, and what do the kids do on it? Are they just them or is it their phone and play games? And, um, and how old are the children? Is there teenagers in there? Are, there, are they running any peer-to-peer -peer groups? So there's a whole lot of activity that could be happening off this one laptop in the household. And, and if I'm a business, I, I think when I, so I'm beginning to look at, A, business laptops. You know, let's try and create some uh, conform you know, if you're from home, the business should really consider providing those laptops for you to work from home. And those laptops would contain the same, the same kind of cyber security uh, software um, that you need to keep it secure and probably not allow you to load other programs and will probably not allow you to copy um, things to a USB stick. So, so already you've got this, this scenario uh, of trying to keep it as secure as possible. So, uh, so Pete, you because I'll just keep talking um, as we go. So, um, so in this account team, so you've got the guy heading up the account team. Um, he is uh, uh, using information which is um, uh, very uh, potentially sensitive to the business. Yep. So you might think about whether he uses a virtual network uh, or a, a VPN, as they, they call it. Um, and um, also make sure that uh, the laptop that he uses is a laptop um, which is not accessible by anyone else at home. Important that, that it's done this way because, um, you know, if, if they're using their own laptops or own PCs, then why shouldn't they let their children use it? But it, coming in the environment that we're in at the moment, working from home, it's important that, that the laptops are used just, just for work-related things. Yeah. And, then, and then you've got the scenario who may be in a shared house where they rent a room or maybe. So if you were just, to look just at... Just stop you there a moment, Simon. Yeah. Sorry. Like this couldn't be more. This couldn't be more apt for me at the minute. So I've just recruited. Um, I've just recruited two members of staff who are going to be working from home, and I'm just getting them set up. And um, they, I know that I know lots of companies now are getting rid of the offices, aren't they, and sending people home. And this is hugely relevant for them because a lot of people genuinely, and I'm sure you're probably dealing with them. They just haven't thought that far ahead, have they? You know, they've maybe just gone to PC World. At best, they've gone to PC World and gone, here you go, here's a laptop to go and work from home. And, uh, and off they've sent them with no, no policy and no, no. Uh, no, no sort of uh, backup at all. So, um, yeah, I really liked your first analogy, which is re very prevalent because, for me, that's something that was happening for me in my previous role before I started the business, being at home with the family, kids using the laptop, um, and then and then me using it for business and there wasn't really a policy in place and this was a big company you know big big blue chip company so um you know there's there was an easy way around what you know the challenges i face so i quite like this next example so someone lives in a shared house which is quite common you know you, you'll have someone in a shared house and they yeah. may not know everyone that's coming and going but they don't want to sit in their bedroom the whole time you know how, hmos are becoming more and more prevalent um a lot of people companies will have team members who live in hmos and obviously they're then in a shared lounge at times so tell us a bit more about what happened with that simon uh yeah so um yeah there was, there was, um, you were making there about um policies um under gdpr we'll use it is um there are a number of policies so there are policies around um working from home that's one of the policies and, and how you keep data secure there's also policies around so for example um when i have a laptop and i'm working from home what can i do on that laptop can i go to facebook can i email my mates you know can i look at twitter you know can i can i so can i use social media on it so what are the rules about that um so that's important that 
that before a lockdown and um, people working from home, you sit down and you look at what do the po- what are the policies I need in place, and, and what do I want them to say, and and if I do go to PC World and uh, just buy a load of laptops, what do I want are these laptops all the same? Uh, what do I want putting on the laptops to make them secure? Uh, and that's where you may have to get an IT company involved to help you set them up. But it's important that you do think about this. You do get them set up um, and that everyone has the same uh, capability on it. So uh, if you're in a shared house, like you say, Pete, um, and you don't know who's coming and going. I mean, one of the biggest issues is if you're in a, a shared house in London, for example, uh, or one of the big cities, um, and say you work in the media business, it's quite likely that your mates will be in a similar industry. So, you know, marketing or media or agency world. And it's quite possible that you'll have people in your house who are in who are effectively working for competitors um, for your business. Now, you know, when you're out having a drink, you know, you're all the same. But if, you've, if you're using that lap, laptop on the kitchen table and you're going through some, uh, some data for your customers and, and you're not doing one of the principles of when you leave the laptop, you, you lock it down so no one else can access it. You leave that up and running and you've got people coming past that can sit down and just have a look at it. I mean, that is, that is also deemed as a breach if they can access that data and that sensitive data. But also, it's, it, there'll be a potentially business data in there. You know, and it could be anything that they could see. And, and um, so that's why it's really important that you do understand the requirement um, that, that your staff is going to be well. Um, and some of these houses could be quite big in London you know, with a number of people. And as Pete says, you know, every person that lives in the house has got 10 or 12 friends, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, they're all coming round. Um, parties happen, uh, you know, um, laptops get stolen. So that's the next scenario. Um, making sure that your, your laptops are encrypted, all the data is encrypted on them. So if they do get stolen, then um, it, the data is safe. And, and if the data is held on the laptop, you then have this uh, task as a business to, to look at your breach protocols. So what data has been lost, how sensitive is it? And then you have to, within 72 hours to decide whether you need to contact the ICO to say that this data has been lost. So. You know, it's, this is serious stuff, really, at the end of the day. Um, and I know we do read about cases where people leave laptops on tubes and uh, USBs fall out of people's pockets in nightclubs. Um, all this stuff's got to be encrypted. And if you do lose it, you've got to tell people. Yeah. A, a, a lot of the, the stuff you're talking about, you know, in the, in the businesses I've worked in in the past, it would be a case of, middle middle level managers and above would have a laptop they took home and then you'd have sort of relatively standard you know reception and customer service assistants what have you they would have a desk-based computer which wouldn't go home with them um and then so a lot of a lot of these companies certainly the ones i've worked in there's a certain level of because someone's reached a middle manager level they will just say oh it's just common sense that you protect your laptop and you look after your laptop and what have you because those people have got a level of responsibility. There may be key holders in the business, for example. So they're, they're used to looking after keys. It may be that they've, they're credit card holders. So they've got access to company funds through the credit card. So they've been vetted for that. But actually, right now, we're unprecedented, aren't we? In that we're in a position where we've got, you know, you've taken someone on. You don't really know who they are. You could have just taken them on and they've got full access at home on a laptop, unsupervised to your company data. Yeah. And, and actually you, you you really need to protect yourself with that so um the next scenario we were going to look at was um and and i just wanted to sort of reiterate that because i know, I know people will listen and when we talk about and I, i'll say it gdpr but we're trying to avoid saying that but when when we say that people will think oh it's just common sense it's just common sense well actually common sense is not so common a lot of the time 
um, as, as people will know from various situations. So this sort of third area. So I'll, I've bought and I'm using my own laptop to do my work on, which is actually pretty much a position I'm in at the minute. Obviously, as I've grown my team, um, I'm looking to add more people. What, what, what would you suggest in that scenario, Simon? Right, okay. So, um, and, and as Pete said, this is quite a common one because um, some people like uh, that they, they buy their laptop um, of a particular spec because, I mean, for example, they could be a, a big gamer. So, you know, they'd be happy to spend a thousand pounds on the laptop. Um, because it's got these added features, whereas for the work you only need a laptop, which is you know three four hundred pounds that won't that will do the job. So so you, you've now got this interesting scenario where you almost have to split the laptop down the middle, uh, work uh, and play. Now it's not uncommon to be able to uh, split your hard drive. And, and have one half of your hard drive having all the programs required to run your business and all the uh, security protocols and the, um, uh, the software to protect your data all coming off one side of the drive. Um, your, your playing activity, whatever that might be, uh, could then be on the other side of the disk. Or, or to be fair, um, what a lot of people are doing now is they stick it in the cloud. So your laptop just becomes the window into the cloud. So all your security is managed in the cloud and your laptop at home is just your way of accessing that data. And so uh, you still have the issues around if you leave your laptop open and, and you don't password protect it, people can still access the information but having it in the cloud is, is actually quite a big benefit if you think about it because um, what it means is that you could take your laptop anywhere um, you know if you're out on the road as long as you had a Wi-Fi connection you could connect to all your files for your business through your password sometimes they use um, fingerprint um, and some are using facial recognition to allow you to get into that but you know that, that, that depends on what the laptop is so so the cloud I think is quite a good option to go to go with I mean if you're looking at something like Windows 365 which is a common package um, you get uh, massive storage and everything's in the cloud so what well, actually that means is you could use any laptop to access that, that data um, as long as you remember all your passwords. So, you know, so you've got that. And the other thing is that um, not everyone can afford really nice laptops. So, you know, for example, you might have bought yourself a second hand one, but it might be quite slow. So, you know, and it could be that by doing the work uh, on it, uh, saving the work on it, that it becomes incredibly slow and boring and you hardly get anything done. And again, if you've got good Wi-Fi, good broadband, and stuff in the cloud, then it doesn't matter how, really how fast the machine is. You can still do um, all the work that you need to do at the end of the day. So, um, sorry, yeah, I so, realised I was, I was just yapping then on a, a muted mic. So, apologies for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one, one of the things it, it was it's slightly off, off, um, or off what we'd prepared to talk about. But talk a little bit more about you. You just mentioned the word passwords um what is have you got a recommended software right. or something like that okay well passwords right i have a real big issue with passwords and um and i'll just come on to that in a minute but one of the things that happened to me the other day i, I use an online um banking um it's not an app it's a capability and and normally you know you go through the usual who are you your postcode and your password but because i don't use it very often through the telephone I can I can never remember what the password is and what they've done this time is they've said to me well rather than worry about your password um, we will use voice recognition so so that means that all I have to do is to ring up ask a couple of questions that I'll know the answer to like how old I am and where do I live yep. and they'll know it's me 
Perfect. And I think that's brilliant. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, but for most of us, passwords have become the vein of our lives. Uh, we have passwords on everything that we use on our laptops. Um, and in there also include four digit numbers that we have to use for our banking cards as well when we want to access money. But what I say to companies about passwords is if you change your password as a business of your employees too often, they will forget what it is. So, for example, if we're changing the password every month or two months, and I go on holiday for two weeks and I come back, the likelihood is because I didn't, because I didn't um, uh, decide what the password is, it was generated for me, I would have forgotten what that password is. Or, even worse, I would have written it down uh, on a notepad and I'll put that in the drawer. Yeah. You know, which is even worse. So, what I say to businesses is allow the staff to choose their own password, but I would recommend that you change the password once or twice a year. And the reason for that is because people will remember your password. They won't have to write it down. Um, and on the basis that they don't tell anyone what a password is, i.e. they don't share access with anyone else um, within the business, no one else should be able to predict what that password is. Yeah. And, and they'll remember it. They'll go on holiday for two weeks, they'll come back. And when they don't remember it, it's then a job for IT, whoever they may be, to then reset the password and go through that whole palaver. Um, so, you know, so that, that's, that's what I think about passwords. Uh, nice. Don't okay. change them too often. Okay, so I've got I've got another scenario for you, Simon. So, yeah. um, children use my laptop. Um, you know, they play games on there, um, and they often have their friends around to play with. Obviously, not on lockdown at the minute, but um, that 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 may be a bit of a challenge, especially if they're playing games over the net. My lab particularly likes to play games over the net. What what would you say might be some challenges with that? Right. Okay. So, um, assuming that you can't afford to give them their own laptop then the issues you've got there are, I mean, generally, you've got to look at things like these games, do they allow in-app purchases? Because that's the worst thing that can happen if they go off with your credit card and go and buy a load of other um, games. They but, all have in-app purchases now, don't they? I know they do. I know they, do. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to hook you in now, don't they? Because they used to charge like 40 or 50 quid for a game, didn't they? Yeah, and now they give yeah. you the game free, and then it's all about, you pay even more over the lifetime yeah. in the game, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of the games now are online. So, you know, there's not a lot you have to download onto your laptop. You know, they just have to, to uh, access it through your laptop. I mean, um, what, one of the things you can do is uh, on a laptop is that um, each of uh, you can have your own login and um, login account and what if you're the administrator of that laptop there are certain things that you can disable on account so if you've got your your kids so they would have their own uh, login and why not give them you know each each of their own login with their own password and then you can sit down as the uh, administrator and decide what they can access and not access and that's that's probably the best way to do it um, you know, and, and so you'd probably say things like they're not allowed to download stuff onto your hard drive D, but they can do it on C or, or they can't run any of your programs. So all this is quite capable within the Windows environment to do. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you have it already. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and I think that's probably the best way. So nice. give them their own login. And then that login has certain levels of access. And the other thing you can do, if you want to be really mean, is um, on the router, you can, you can decide um, what time of the day they can access stuff through the router. So you can switch that router off for them. Um, say you want them in bed by 10 o'clock. You could do it so that whatever they're on, whatever tools they're using, it shuts down at 10 o'clock. And they don't get any more Wi-Fi or broadband. Nice. 
That would be very unpopular in my house like, with my teenage daughter. <laughs> I swear, I swear she's on TikTok till like early hours in the morning. It's a nightmare. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so the next, the next scenario we have, which is, which is, again, is going to be very, very common, especially with people working from home is they're going to want to meet up at Costa. Okay. They're going to, they're going to want to go out yeah. to Costa. Sorry. Other coffee shops are available. Sorry. I'm not here to advertise <laughs> anyone really. I, I personally prefer Starbucks, but um, you know, each to each their own. Right. But there's lots yeah. of nice coffee places out there near us. Uh, anyway, but, People are going to want to go up and they're going to meet out or they or, or they're maybe going to want to, I don't know, take the dog up to walk at the park and take the laptop with them or, or whatever it may be. Um, can that present some other challenges? Well, yeah. So now you've got this, um, you've got a scenario where the laptop is being taken out of the office environment into the sort of what I would call like the unknown environment. So uh, if you do go up to, I think the one on Hampton, uh, the Costa up there, the drive through, if you go up there on any day um, for a coffee, you will see loads of people sat at the tables with their with their laptops, with their laptops open. And the other thing I noticed, Bentley's in the driveway. So you know, there's a lot of money going on in this Costa and Hampton. You should go and have a look sometime. Yeah. But anyway, so I drive um, past regularly, and I'm, I'm all, their car park is almost like a forecourt. It's it almost like a forecourt for like a prestige car place. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And they're lovely, lovely like little MacBooks and stuff like that out yeah. on the desk. And it's like yeah. you know deals are happening. Yeah. Big money stuff. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And then they're probably just going off to the toilet and just leaving them open, aren't they? Right. <laughs> they do. Well, I mean, you have. I mean, you're drinking all that coffee. You have to go to the toilet. And the likelihood is that you're not going to uh, pack everything up and take it in the toilet with you because you'll lose your your space at the table, won't you? So, you know, you either hang on or you have to leave it there yeah, uh, when so. you go to the loop. But, I mean, you know, it's important that all the data on, on your machine is encrypted, uh, that you've got a password and you do lock your laptop down so other people can't, can't see it. And also, I mean, you know, if someone was to come in and, and nick your laptop, if it's a, um, if it's a Mac you know like a or, or an ipad ios you know there, there, there's there's programs that can track can track the uh um, the machine as it as it gets stolen and driven off somewhere and you can also put those on your own laptop as well like a like a little tracker software yeah um but that's the thing about having stuff in the cloud if you have it in the cloud people don't nick the cloud they might nick your laptop but actually everything you, you want is in the cloud. So all you've got to do is just buy a new laptop and you've got access to everything that you needed. In the, first time. the only thing is you'll lose your photographs that you probably mm. put on there of your, of your pet dog or something. <laughs> <laughs> cat videos or what have you yeah. but uh, do you know what i've just had a i've had a memory come back to me of like 10 years ago when i used to run a run a body shop and uh, i had some i was a manager there and i used to have yeah. some got some older guys work for me um or part of the team there and uh, they couldn't get the hang of like every time you leave your desk lock your lock your computer yeah. um good practice and uh, yeah, my, my, my little punishment would be if they went off to like leave to go to the toilet or go and make a coffee and they left their laptop or computer un unlocked, yeah. I'd go in and change their desk <laughs> to the background screen to something <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> but they were such technophobes, they wouldn't know how to change it again. <laughs> <laughs> They, used to, oh, <laughs> they soon learned to lock their lock their computers though, because I then wouldn't change it back for them. They had to find out how to. Do it. <laughs> well, on a similar vein, there's a um, one of the policies um, for um, looking after your data is um, a clear desk policy, and uh, a clear desk policy is the vein of a lot of businesses. But basically, it's there because um, what people don't realise or forget is that if you're in an office. So this is not at home now, but off it. But it works on a similar way. Um, there, there'll be other people, there'll be cleaners coming in after work. And um, if you've got bits of paper with, um, you know, personal information, so maybe you've done a review of a couple of staff members and you've got it left them on your desk, you know, cleaners can come in and they can read this information. Um, and so you've got to really think about, well, when I'm, when I'm leaving this desk, putting stuff away and it's the same for home as well making sure that stuff gets gets locked away so 
So I have, I have this client and um, we, we, we had the policy, the clear desk policy, and uh, everyone was signed up to it. Um, so what I did was I gave them, I gave them three weeks and then, and then I went in on a Sunday and I went around all their desks and I was looking for personal and sensitive data that had been left on their desk. And, and every file I found of this data, I would pick it up and I'd put post-it notes saying, please collect from your chief exec. And so what they had to do on a Monday when they came in the office and they found this post-it note was they had to go to their chief exec and ask for their file back. So it was a bit of like the walk of shame that they had to make to, to collect this data. And you know what? They, they only did it once. They didn't do it again. They, they, they learned the, the fact that, you know, it is relevant that you should think about what you leave on your desk before you go home. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, one, one of the uh, things you just reminded me was one, one of the, I, I went to Amazon a little while ago and I went and visited the warehouse and it was, uh, it, I found it really, really fascinating actually the way they, they work, the way they stack the shelves and everything there. You would have thought it was like a library and things were put together. Well, actually no, they're just unloaded and they're literally just ordered by weight, heavy at the bottom, medium in the middle and light at the top. And you might have, maybe 10 locations for the same book, for example, if it's a popular book, because it just means that the computer can send the picker to the most efficient place to pick. Oh, okay. it. And um, one of the things I thought was quite interesting was, you know, <laughs> I need to be careful what I say that someone might be buying, but say they're buying like something they shouldn't be from Amazon. And you've obviously got a data issue there. Like how much do the pickers know what you're buying? And um, it was quite interesting that actually, they don't, you, the customer information isn't known. They just know what the order is and they go around and pick the information. And actually that it all is boxed up and then the customer name is introduced yeah. For, yeah. for printing. I found that, I found that fascinating. It wasn't something I'd ever really considered because I'm not really one for buying rabbits and things like that, that I shouldn't be. <laughs> well, they sell but, baby rabbits today. <laughs> they put holes in the box so they can breathe. Or, or, you know, again, I'm not advertising yeah. any other sex toy that you might want to pick. But <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, right. So the sixth and final scenario, uh, I, I watch my stream TV, which I do, Netflix yeah. and Prime and what have you, uh, play games on the company laptop. Um, you know, it's easy. It's there. I've just finished work, crack on. Um, and I load my own programs on there as well. What, what, what sort of the situation with that, Simon? Well, um, yeah, so... Th th so the situation you've got here is um, one of the one of the other big issues with people using laptops is um, apart from the the Chinese trying to hack your machine is uh, they call them um, phishing. So these are the websites which aren't really websites, or they're web websites with a load of uh, malware on, uh, which are trying to get hold of your machine so they can. Uh, they, they could take it over. Uh, I, I read, was it today or yesterday, that uh, I think Australia's had the biggest hack ever in the world. And um, it, was, it was one of these where they try and force a lot of data uh, into, into websites. And they'd worked out that something like 74 million laptops have been, or machines have been taken over by the malware to allow it to do this so you know so it happens so um you know you need the right kind of software to 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 sort of say look don't look at this website there's something we don't like about it um and also you just need to be aware that um <laughs> you see there's this other issue okay um and th this, this issue is you, you've had something to drink and in fact, you've had too much to drink. Never happened, and, mate. <laughs> yeah, or whatever, it, whatever your tipple is, and and it's late at night, and 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 you decide to go on and look to buy something. So uh, this is the worst scenario because a you could be going looking at a website which isn't really what it is. So you know it could be a branded website, but actually it's some kind of Chinese sweatshop which really just wants your, your money details. 
um, or it's a laptop which is going to download some some data uh, onto your laptop. And you know this is the worst scenario because when you've had some drink or you're really relaxed, then you know perhaps you're not as um, you know you know you just things can happen yeah. to your laptop which means less, less that, vigilant you're less yeah, vigilant yeah that, that it could be compromised yeah so um so that that's why it's it I, I think you know the perfect world is you have a laptop for work and then you have a laptop for play uh and that the two never really meet i think that's mm-hmm. you know if you can afford it you know which is the the other scenario because but I mean, I have seen recently that the price of laptops um, has come down, but they are still, you know, you will pay three, four, five hundred pounds for a laptop. Yeah. But, um, you know, maybe it's a good investment for your yep. business at the end of the day. Yeah. So if you're a business owner, would you suggest, if you were providing staff laptops, would you suggest that you had a policy where, whilst it seems quite strict that they don't use it for personal use, um, in reality, it feels quite strict because it seems to me, it seems quite strict and restrictive, what have you, especially when, for example, I've got a marketing person starting, for example, so I've got a marketing person starting. So they, they need access to all those social social media channels for business anyway. Yeah. So it's quite easy for the lines to get a little bit blurred there, yeah. but actually in reality, it's not too difficult for them because they've got access to it from their phone, from their tablet. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, 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 there's a lot of them that have got other stuff. So I just, What's your input on that? Is it much better to just kind of try and keep it strictly business on the laptop? Well, it is, but to be fair, if you want to know what they're up to, just go and have a look at their their Facebook page because it's got time and days on there. So you can see what they're posting and you can see what they're doing. So because social media, you know, social means that, you know, other people can see what's going on. So if you want to know whether they're working or not, just go and have a look at their social yeah. media. Got you. But, but you're right, Pete. It is... Uh, there, there is there is a policy, the working from home policy, um, which which should sort of put down some of the principles of of, of how you use uh, social media. But a marketing person would be expected to use social media as part of their part of their job. Um, and if they, you know, but accounts, uh, you know, maybe social media is not a big thing for them. But if they want to go on social media. Then, then just use their phones, you know. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Media. The next question I had was obviously yeah. with people going to work remotely, there's going to be a lot more Zoom calls happening, um, and and this is something with, in in particular that I've actually experienced firsthand through through networking as well. And there's this reluctance, or there may be a perceived reluctance from some people to actually go on camera. Um, is there anything that you know, how how should people sort of manage that and try and get people on on brilliant on the question right okay brilliant question. <laughs> are you pleased to ask that one yeah i am yeah <laughs> right okay so if you take gdpr as, as the law of the land um when we're on a video and, and it's and it has to be work related so if i'm your boss um you you and i'm 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 zooming you at, at home um Everything that's in that image um, on that Zoom is is private, is, is data, uh, personal data. And, and you have a right for that to be private. So the reality is, uh, well, that's not the reality, but if you took it to the law, you could refuse to have the Zoom camera on. Now, one of the things that Zoom has done, and it's done this for various reasons, is that it allows you to change the background. And and the reason it allows you to change the background is so you can block out any pictures of what you've got on the wall and what sits behind you. Now, um, in your GDPR policy, working from home, one of the things that you would probably want to look at is asking for consent for staff uh, to use Zoom and you have the ability to request that they use Zoom so you could see them on the, on the video. Um, and you can refuse that consent if you wanted to. Um, but I've not heard of anyone doing that. And the reality is that, um, you know, most people are happy 
for um, for their boss to see them um, on Zoom. Um, because under the circumstances, there's not a lot of other people that they get to see. So, but, but there's a boss. I can't force it on you. No, yeah, yeah. Day, you. you have a right to keep it private. Mm. I'm, um, I'm so disappointed with the setup at home as well because I'd love to have like a library of books at the back. So I look really educated like the people on the news. Well, uh, Pete, if you found a photograph of a shelf of books, could use that as the background for your zoom there we go so, the only thing with my laptop is i don't think the camera's good enough because i d whenever i try and use a background i'm all blurry and what have you it looks rubbish so maybe yeah, i need like a yeah, green screen already, or yeah. something yeah the best screen. the best one i i've seen is um skype have a button that blurs the background out and it works oh, nice. really well so nice. you can't tell but i i like seeing what's Um, there was this thing about having a load of books in the background, but, you know. <laughs> people know you don't read them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially some of those politicians I see on the news. I think if you'd read those books, you probably wouldn't be such an idiot. But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you try and read down the spine just to see what some of these books are. Yeah, absolutely. I, I saw, I, in fact, I, I can't remember who it was, but I was watching the news the other day and someone had clearly tried to make a point of their positioning because they'd actually turned, they'd turned, there were three books behind them, which they'd turned face forward. Right. So they, they, they were making a point. Um, he wasn't on the screen for very long or I only caught him for a short bit of time. I didn't yeah. think to go back, but I wondered that there's clearly a point being made by those three books, particularly being being yeah. turned around that way, so you could see see the uh, face of them. Um, and so, and yeah. there was a there was a case very recently, um, an Italian Parliament, where um, one of the councillors was a woman, um, and I realised the camera was on, and and she undrew in in front of the camera, so she had was on this call, so there was about, I don't know, 20 councillors. Her, she went to be naked, topless, as she was undressing, and then put her clothes back on. So, you know, you've you, you got to be careful. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So here's, here's a story for you, actually, with Maggie, my wife, um, and those who are on the podcast listening and not watching, that they're going to struggle with this. But yeah. just there, that's a wardrobe, which has got a sliding door. And the door yeah. that slides across is mirrored. And just over there, just where my hand is off camera, my wife was getting changed on Friday with the mirror here. So right. her over there mirrored onto my screen. I had to go like that with my hand. <laughs> yeah, but she knew that, Pete. You know what your wife's like. <laughs> Brilliant. So, yeah, and I had, I had to go like that. I was like, you're naked on camera. <laughs> fortunately no one noticed but uh, yeah she was mortified and ever since then we've working out how we can change change the setup in the house to be able to uh, try and prevent that from happening again so that's uh, that's good fun um simon thanks for joining me how yeah. do how do people engage you so you know obviously lots of businesses out there handle personal data and and need support from you um how do they engage your services and, and what can they expect when you come in because I suppose you'd do an audit and just sort of see where the compliance is currently and then make recommendations for adjustment. Can you just sort of talk us through how that works? Yeah, so um, so, so my business is called PMA Limited and uh, we will have a, uh, we're just doing our website at the moment, but we should be up shortly. But my email is uh, simon at p-m-a.co.uk and the way it works is that... Um, People contact me because they know they need to do something uh, with regards to their data and GDPR. They don't know what to do, um, or they've read all the books, but they still don't know what to do, or, or um, there's some fines which are happening, and so maybe they decided to do something. And the way it works is that um, I have a conversation with them about what data they have, uh, what their, what's their security like? What have they got in place at the moment? And I basically do, as you say, Pete, I, I do an audit and I do a gap analysis. So I show them where they are 
today and where they should be and we can see the gaps and then I do an action plan that uh, um, will close the gaps and, and and the way I do it is I say to them look you could do some of these things you could do all of them uh, or I'll do some of them. I, I, you know it's leave it up to them what they want to do so and, and the other thing is I also help businesses I, I, I do a lot of training as well and training is is probably one of the key elements of GDPR training staff to understand and realize the value of data data that they use on a day-to-day -day business um, because staff I'm afraid uh, as we've talked about today are the weakest link and um, and my job is to make sure that they're not the weakest link um, and so that's where training comes in so I do do quite a lot of training and I'm also doing training on Zoom as well which works quite well Perfect. Thank you, Simon. I think, um, you know, I do compliance related stuff totally different in regards vehicles and, and heavy yeah. goods vehicles. But when there's a standard or a criteria that you need to meet and when you're yeah. below that standard, actions need to be taken to meet it. And I think, you know, I, I, I do empathize because actually when we right at the top of the podcast, when we first spoke about GDPR, it's a little bit like people just go, oh, yeah, not relevant to me or, or whatever it may be. But actually, you know, in the same way that I help transport operators make sure they, they meet their standards, yeah. you can write things off and go, it's not going to happen to me or it's not going to, you know, they've not felt the pain enough. But at some yeah. point, one of those two things are going to happen. They're going to have a breach or what have you, and they're going to need uh, yeah. your support. And it, I, I suppose it's much easier to just go, do you know what, let's take preventative action up front. Yeah, it is. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. And the other thing is that... Um, with Brexit, um, if you're a business, you have a website and you sell your products into the EU and also into America and other countries, um, there's, there's stuff that you need to be made aware of with regards to data protection as well. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of things happening around the world and globally, I say this about globally, um, most countries now in the world uh, have built or are, are about to or actually put into place a similar framework to GDPR so you know we said something about about you know GDPR the fact that Brazil India Australia you know Singapore that these are all countries which have built their own version of GDPR and put it into place because they realize that data has value you know and if you can't move data around the world then you know it's going to suppress your commerce yeah so you know it's a big thing 100 percent. no brilliant brilliant well thank you so much for joining me simon um i really really appreciate it i think it's been absolutely fascinating and i hope the listeners have enjoyed it thank you listeners for tuning in and uh, we'll be back next week with another fantastic guest thanks again for joining us simon and catch you all soon thank take you. care thank you so much for tuning in we really appreciate your time Please do follow me at Pete Rushmer on LinkedIn or on Facebook, follow Flagship Training UK and you can find us on YouTube too at Flagship UK.